Hi, everyone. This week, I have another essay for you. This one by Kyle Samani of Multicoin Capital, titled The Most Forkable DeFi Protocols on Ethereum. He looks at how easy it would be from an effort and capital standpoint to fork each of the major DeFi protocols. He makes a strong case for how and why he thinks protocols like Maker are quite defensible, and why he believes certain DEXs are less so. He also looks at the implications these DeFi protocols have on Ethereum's defensibility. It's a thought-provoking essay, especially considering everything DeFi has been through in recent weeks. Also, it'll be interesting to see how new developments like TBTC, the new trustless version of Bitcoin coming to DeFi, will play out by the metrics Kyle is weighing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what he says. And now, here's the most forkable DeFi protocols on Ethereum. Enjoy the show. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. It has the tightest security, deep liquidity, and a great fee structure with no minimum or hidden fees. Whether you're looking for a simple fiat on-ramp or futures trading, Kraken is the place for you. What's the best way to spend crypto? The MCO Visa card lets you spend anywhere Visa is accepted, including your coffee shop or the Apple Store, all with up to 5% back. Download the Crypto.com app and reserve yours now. Hi, I'm Kyle Samani, and today I'm going to be talking about the defensibility of Ethereum's DeFi protocols. As a suite of new Layer 1 blockchains are launching, I've been thinking about Ethereum's network effects and the defensibility of the DeFi protocols built on top of Ethereum. A couple of years ago, I wrote about the network effects of non-sovereign Layer 1 monies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Since then, the DeFi ecosystem on top of Ethereum has blossomed. Utilizing a couple dozen DeFi protocols, users have withdrawn a few hundred million dollars of debt that's fully collateralized against an even larger pool of capital. Now that these protocols are collectively facilitating a few hundred million dollars of economic activity, it's possible to begin to reason about defensibility. One way to do this is to quantify and compare network effects. However, it's very difficult to quantify network effects with precision since the underlying dynamics of each protocol are unique, therefore making it challenging to compare each protocol on an apples-to-apples basis. In this essay, I'll consider the one effort and two capital required to fork each of the major DeFi protocols. Then I'll rank the relative strengths of these network effects and conclude with a discussion of Ethereum's ecosystem-level defensibility. This essay assumes working knowledge of each protocol. First, let's start with a synthetic stablecoin, such as Maker. About a year ago, I wrote about how Layer 2 assets, such as MKR, which is the equity of the MakerDAO system, can capture value in a permissionless and open setting. In that essay, I specifically identified the presence of unforkable state, as the key to value capture. The best example of unforkable state is the collateral that backs a loan. In the context of Maker, the obvious unforkable state is the collateral, uh, which is primarily ETH backing the DAI loans. However, it's now clear that this framing is incomplete. To understand why, let's assume that the only source of network effect for Maker is the collateral. A wealthy third party could fork all of Maker's contracts and create an alt Maker ecosystem they could deposit tens of millions of dollars of collateral to bootstrap liquidity in that alternative ecosystem. But what then? The Altmaker ecosystem is useless if no one wants to buy or interact with AltDAI. Maker's most potent source of defensibility is not MKR or the collateral backing the DAI loans, but the liquidity and the usability of DAI. DAI must be liquid in order for Maker to be usable. If someone withdraws DAI debt against ETH collateral, the DAI is useless if there's no liquidity for the DAI. But usability is a a superset of liquidity. DAI's usability is clear in its acceptance by merchants, its use in other protocols like Augur, and its use as collateral in lending protocols like Compound and LendFMe. DAI is plugged into all kinds of third-party apps, services, and infrastructure, and that makes it more useful and usable. The combination of DAI's liquidity and usability is a powerful moat. A well-capitalized alt-maker team could try and offer a higher die savings rate, and they could try and pay third parties to integrate alt die, but it's unclear if this would gain meaningful traction. Next, let's turn to fiat collateralized stablecoins, such as Tether. While Tether is not a pure DeFi protocol, with an outstanding market cap of over $5 I included it because it's such an integral part of the crypto ecosystem. 
The source of defensibility for Tether is clear. It's the most liquid asset in the crypto ecosystem alongside BTC. It is available on all major non-US exchanges, serves as collateral for many derivatives exchanges, and is used to settle a huge percentage of OTC trades. Despite fierce competition from USDC, PAX, TrueUSD, Gemini Dollar, DAI, and others, USDT still commands more than 80% of the stablecoin market when measured using market cap. This is the ultimate testament to the defensibility of USDT. There are a few teams that are working on stablecoin clearinghouses, including DeFi protocols such as Stablecoin Swap and Shell, and centralized clearinghouses such as Stablehouse. If these are successful, and therefore reduce the friction associated with trading stablecoins, Tether may be negatively impacted. For example, if these protocols and companies provide strong guarantees that large quantities of stablecoins can be swapped with minimal slippage, derivatives exchanges may begin to accept other stablecoins as collateral. Today, cryptocurrency derivatives exchange FTX offers this service natively. However, the presence of liquid stablecoin clearinghouses may accelerate this trend for other exchanges, which is likely bad for Tether. Next, let's turn to collateralized money markets, such as Compound and Lendf.me. The unforkable state in the crypto lending protocol Compound is the collateral in the system. Therefore, the defensibility of Compound can be understood as follows. As the value of the collateral pool increases, borrowers can borrow more capital at lower rates, which then draws in more lenders. That cycle is virtuous. So how difficult is it for someone to fork Compound and therefore bootstrap liquidity into an alt Compound? Well, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, An alt Compound team can... 1. Support assets that Compound itself does not support, for example, Tether. 2. They could introduce more favorable collateralization ratios and liquidation penalties. 3. They could lend their own assets in the alt Compound pool at a competitive or even discounted rate. And 4. They could subsidize third-party lenders to undercut Compound's rates. Today, Compound is less than $100 million of collateral backing the system. If the creators of an alt Compound undercut Compound's rates by subsidizing users for example, on the order of 100 basis points per year, the annualized opportunity cost of bootstrapping liquidity would be less than $1 million. This level of scale is easily venture fundable. However, in addition to Compound's internal liquidity in the form of lending and borrowing rates, Compound is also subject to a couple of unique forms of external liquidity that may provide additional defensibility. First, there are third-party aggregators, such as Instadap, Zerion, Ray, Idle Finance, Aave, and others, These systems route deposits to Compound, which in turn lowers borrowing rates, which then attracts more borrowers. While organic capital flow is certainly good, it's not clear that it matters on the margin because an alt Compound team can subsidize rates to bootstrap liquidity anyways. Interestingly, the presence of aggregators could actually backfire because the aggregators are incentivized to send user assets to the highest yielding lending pools. Assuming similarly trusted contracts, governance, and oracle mechanics, Aggregators may not be loyal to Compound at the expense of their users, and so an alt Compound team can actually win over aggregators with subsidies. Moreover, a sufficiently large aggregator can siphon liquidity away from Compound into its own pool or an alt Compound fork. While this hasn't happened yet, I expect it will in the coming years. So overall, it's unclear if third-party aggregators will act as a substantial source of defensibility for Compound. Second, let's consider C tokens which represent your balance in Compound and accrue interest over time. C-tokens are somewhat analogous to DAI. If third-party apps integrate C-tokens, for example, for use as collateral in other lending protocols, that makes C-tokens more usable outside of the core Compound protocol. That makes it difficult for lenders, in this case the C-token holders, to move from Compound to an alt Compound. While the maker slash DAI and Compound slash C-token analogy is good, it's not perfect. The only reason to create DAI is to sell it for something else, for example, more ETH. Therefore, alt maker is useless unless there is a market for alt DAI. However, this is not true for Compound. Compound is still useful even if third-party apps do not utilize C tokens. Empirically, this is all playing out as the theory would predict. The China-based DeForce community forked the Compound code base and launched a collateralized money market protocol called LendF.me. They've already bootstrapped more than about $20 million of collateral into the system in just a few months. They accomplished this by, one, offering protocols that Compound does not support, notably Tether, IMBTC, and HBTC, and two, 
localizing the service with third-party integrations for Chinese users. It does not appear that the DeForce community had to subsidize rates on LendMe to accomplish this. This was able to happen all organically. It's clear then that Maker is more defensible than Compound. With a subsidy budget, anyone can fork Compound and bootstrap liquidity internal to its lending and borrowing market. Uh, but successfully forking Maker requires more than a subsidy budget. It requires liquidity and usability for DAI external to the protocol itself. Next, let's consider a generalized synthetic asset protocol such as Synthetix. Synthetix is a specific type of exchange focused on trading synthetic assets. The defensibility of an exchange is generally understood to be a function of liquidity. However, Synthetix is not a traditional exchange because it does not offer a central limit order book like virtually all other major exchanges across both traditional markets and crypto. All exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Coinbase, and Binance offer central limit order books. One of the defining features of Synthetix is that takers do not incur any slippage when trading synth synthetic assets against the collateral pool. However, liquidity is limited in this model based on the amount of collateral in the system. This means that liquidity, and therefore defensibility, is primarily a function of available collateral. Interestingly, the growth of the synthetics exchange is actually hampered by the need for takers to onboard into the synthetics ecosystem by trading real assets, such as ETH, for synthetic assets, such as SETH. Today, most users onboard into the synthetics ecosystem via the decentralized exchange called Uniswap. The largest liquidity pool on Uniswap is actually SETH to ETH. So, while the need for a liquidity bridge is a constraint to growth, it's also conversely a moat. If someone forks the synthetics ecosystem to create alt synthetics, she will need to bootstrap an analogous liquidity bridge. So, how do the network effects of synthetics compare to that of Maker and Compound? First, let's consider the collateral in the protocol. Like in the cases of alt Maker and alt Compound, anyone who forks synthetics can capitalize the collateral pool themselves or subsidize others for doing so. Therefore, the collateral base is unlikely to provide meaningful defensibility. Next, let's consider exogenous assets. DAI in the case of Maker, C tokens in the case of Compounds, and synthetic assets in the case of synthetics. Unlike Maker's DAI, synthetic assets do not require liquidity extra to the protocol, by design. Instead, synths are more comparable to Compound C tokens. Like C tokens, synthetic assets can be used as collateral in third-party apps, uh, but they don't need to in order for the protocol to function. While this could become a source of defensibility in the future, it has not yet. And the last major form of defensibility for synthetics is the real asset synthetic asset bridge. While synthetics leverages Uniswap for this today, an alt synthetics team could easily provide their own real asset alternative synthetic asset bridge using Uniswap, Kyber, or other freely available DeFi protocols. Why should you get an MCO Visa card from Crypto.com? First, it's a beautiful metal card. You can top up the card with crypto and spend anywhere Visa is accepted. You also get up to 5% back every time you spend on all spending, including your morning coffee, gas, or even a new phone. You know they'll pay for your Spotify and Netflix, too. You'll love the unlimited airport lounge access and interbank exchange rates if you travel a lot. There are so many cool perks loaded in one card. Download the Crypto.com app and reserve yours now. Today's episode is brought to you by Kraken. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. With all the recent exchange hacks and other troubles, you want to trade on an exchange you can trust. Kraken's focus on security is utterly amazing. Their liquidity is deep and their fee structure is great with no minimum or hidden fees. They even reward you for trading so you can make more trades for less. If you're a beginner, you will find an easy on-ramp from five fiat currencies. And if you're an advanced trader, you'll love their 5x margin and futures trading. To learn more, please go to kraken.com. That's K-R-A-K-E-N dot com. Next, let's consider automated market makers, such as Uniswap, Stablecoin Swap, Shell, Bancor, FutureSwap, and Kyber. Compound is an automated market maker albeit for borrowing and lending instead of for trading. As such, the defensibility of most of these trading-focused automated market makers can be understood to be comparable to that of Compound, excluding the notion of C-tokens. Empirically, this seems to be the case. While not all of these automated market makers are directly competitive because of different product focuses, 
such as focusing on stable coins versus futures. The defensibility of each protocol is primarily a function of the size of each protocol's liquidity pool. Whereas larger liquidity pools in Compound allow for tighter lending and borrow rates, larger liquidity pools in trading-focused automated market makers offer lower slippage for takers. On-chain liquidity protocol Kyber has become the most liquid automated market maker over the last 12 months, uh, largely by tapping into other automated market maker liquidity pools, such as Uniswap, and two, by by leveraging third-party integrations that route taker order flow. It's clear that all of the automated market makers are going to tap into one another's liquidity pools as they continue to improve over time. For example, 0x just enabled this in their most recent V3 upgrade. Paradoxically, once all of the automated market makers within a given vertical, for example, stablecoin swaps, tap into one another's liquidity pools, all of those automated market makers become perfect substitutes. None of the automated market makers will be able to compete on distribution. The ultimate winner from this end state of perfect competition will be takers who will therefore always receive best execution. Next, let's consider non-custodial limit order book exchanges. This would include DYDX, IDEX, NUO, and 0x. The defensibility of these protocols are comparable to those of centralized exchanges, albeit with a few disadvantages. First, all of these protocols are subject to the constraints of the underlying blockchain, which ultimately settle trades. These limitations include non-deterministic order execution, high latency, and minor front running. All of these constraints deter liquidity providers and therefore increase slippage for takers. Second, these decentralized exchanges generally do not support cross-margining and position netting. While I hope to eventually see this develop in the DeFi ecosystem, it's clear that this is years away. Meanwhile, centralized exchanges like FTX and Binance offer cross-margining today and are rapidly expanding their product offerings to maximize capital efficiency for traders. And lastly, let's consider a mixer called Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash is unique among the other DeFi protocols above. While others are focused on borrowing, lending, and trading, Tornado is focused on mixing funds to maximize user privacy. Today, Tornado Cash does not support private payments in a pool. Rather, it can just be used to anonymize funds. The source of defensibility in Tornado is the size of the anonymity pool. Since funds cycle through the pool relatively quickly, for example, the entire asset base seems to turn over every one to two weeks, the network effects are by definition fleeting. Uh, moreover, beyond a certain point, a marginally larger anonymity set doesn't really matter. For example, as the anonymity set grows from 500 to 1,000 addresses, it's not clear that the next marginal user cares. Who is the marginal user who believes that 1 out of 500 is not good enough, but that 1 out of 1,000 is? Thus, in its current form, Tornado Cash is not that defensible. However, in a future version of the service, Tornado Cash aims to support privacy-enabled asset transfers inside of the privacy pool, rather than just anonymizing funds, which is what's available today. In this model, capital will be a lot stickier as it won't leave the ecosystem so quickly. This will allow the anonymity pool to grow much larger, making it more useful for larger amounts of capital. The notion that large amounts of capital will only enter a large privacy pool is, is unique relative to the other DeFi protocols discussed earlier. For example, if the entire privacy pool is just 1,000 ETH, that pool may not be useful for someone wishing to anonymize 9,000 ETH. And in fact, that could be harmful for the first 1,000 ETH owners in the pool, as the owners of that first 1,000 ETH may not want a 90% probability of being associated with the other 9,000 ETH. For a user who wants to anonymize 10,000 ETH, they may require a pool of 90,000 ETH. This model, while not yet available, uh, is clearly more defensible than the status quo because it enables the wealthiest people to use the service, and the wealthiest people, by definition, uh, have the most capital and have the largest incentive to hide their wealth. Okay, now let's get to the rankings. After considering the hypothetical difficulty of forking these protocols and the empirical evidence we have in a limited number of cases, I've ranked the defensibility of these protocols from strongest to weakest. Note that this ranking is necessarily conjecture, as it's impossible to quantify and therefore rank on a purely objective basis. First, Tether and other fiat collateralized stablecoins. Second, synthetic stablecoins such as Maker. Third, mixers such as Tornado Cash. Fourth, generalized synthetic asset protocols such as Synthetics. Fifth, collateralized money markets such as Compound and Lendeth.me. Sixth, automated market makers such as Uniswap. Set and lastly, non-custodial exchanges such as DYDX, IDEX, and NUO. I ranked USDT at the top because it faces the most competition 
and is still five to ten times larger than its largest competitor, which is USDC. While Tether is controversial, it's extremely defensible. Coinbase is one of the best capitalized companies in the space, and it's been unable to meaningfully displace USDT after 18 months. While it's possible that stablecoin clearinghouses may change to these dynamics in the future, it's too early to know. Based on the commentary above, it should be clear why Maker's next. The Maker protocol does not function if DAI is not liquid and not usable external to the core protocol. Both of these traits are not easily forkable and are not easy to subsidize. I ranked Tornado third above the lending and trading protocols because wealthy users who are going to provide the vast majority of capital in these protocols require the presence of other wealthy users in order to make these systems work. And because wealth is not evenly distributed, I expect that the market may only support one to two privacy pools rather than the 10 plus that are available for trading and lending. Next is synthetics. While I noted that synthetics and compound are similar in terms of their network effects, I ultimately chose to rank synthetics above compound because of the real asset synthetic asset bridge that acts as an additional form of defensibility. Below that, the common traits among the protocols in the bottom half of the list is heightened competition. This is clear empirically. Entrepreneurs and venture investors are betting that these markets are not that defensible. Furthermore, as discussed above, competitors can easily bootstrap liquidity in most of these markets fairly easy by subsidizing liquidity. Okay, and with that, we can now turn to ecosystem-level network effects. I'll conclude this essay by considering the implications of everything discussed above on Ethereum's defensibility at the ecosystem level. In short, Ethereum's defensibility, at least as it pertains to DeFi protocols, is materially stronger than that of any individual DeFi protocol. The primary source of Ethereum's defensibility is not capital or liquidity, but it's the composability and interoperability of these protocols as a whole. It's truly amazing that someone can use ETH as collateral, withdraw DAI against it, lend out that DAI on Compound or LendF.me, and use that DAI as collateral to borrow ZRX, and then sell the ZRX for ETH all in a single transaction, in a single moment in time. The ultimate testament to the power of Ethereum-level network effects around DeFi was the recent BZX attack that took place on Valentine's Day. The attacker's transaction was likely the single most complex transaction ever processed by the Ethereum network, chaining together five sophisticated protocols. Recreating this level of interoperable infrastructure in any ecosystem is going to take years, just as it took Ethereum years to build to where it is today. As such, I recommend that most new Layer 1 teams focus on other use cases beyond DeFi, at least until they bootstrap their respective ecosystems. Bravo to the Ethereum community for pioneering DeFi. Thanks to Hasib Qureshi, Alex Pruden, Ali Yaha, and Michael Anderson for providing feedback on this essay. This is Kyle Samani from Multicoin Capital. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Kyle and to read his essay at unchainedpodcast.com, check out the show notes inside your podcast player. All crypto, no hype, some merch. Shop Unchained t-shirts, hats, mugs, and stickers at shop.unchainedpodcast.com. Again, that's shop.unchainedpodcast.com. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Factual Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Josh Durham, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.